Dear God, we pause here. We've already lifted up our voices and praise. We've rejoiced with all heaven as people have given their hearts to you. And Lord, as we are about to open up your word and, and dig in, I just pray that we will uh, see you in such a way that our hearts will be changed, that our lives will be changed. And in all that we do, uh, we will want to serve you and love you and recognize all that you have done for us. In your name we pray, amen. We may or may not realize it, but uh, experts are, are telling us that our society is continuing to be in the midst of a pandemic. Maybe not a, a viral pandemic, although that's still around as well, but this is a pandemic of, of loneliness, a pandemic of people feeling that they are cut off even in our society that is so connected in so many ways. We have people watching online. We have uh, people that can connect into Sabbath school online. You can pull out your phone and you can send a message around the world right this very instant, and yet still people are feeling disconnected and feeling lonely, and it's a growing uh, challenge in our world. People feel insignificant as they look on their little devices, and they see everyone's highlights. We see the vacations that people have taken. We see their children smiling at church in, in their beautiful clothes. We see the success and the promotions and the victories in softball or whatever it might be. We see everyone else's highlights, and then we look at our own life, and there's some highlights but there's also some low lights. We're not putting those online. And then there's a whole lot of days that are just going through the routine, day after day, work, meal, television, work, meal, television, work, mow the lawn, meal, television, and we're just caught in this routine, and we don't seem to have the pictures so often that we can share with others. And we see the highlights in, in the world, and it makes us often feel lonely. It makes us feel insignificant. And another challenge that we have is that, that we know who we are, and we know mistakes that we have made. We know things that we have said that we shouldn't have said. We know things that we did that would have been better left undone. And, and we see ourselves and we think that that's who we are, that we are made up by these mistakes, and we find ourselves thinking too often that we are broken, that we are insignificant, that we cannot make a difference in the world. Now, if you're like me, there's been times where you have opened up the cabinet in your kitchen, and you have pulled out a plate or a bowl, you've eaten your bowl of ice cream, and then when you're taking the bowl to the sink. My wife will tell you that's the next day, maybe. Um, and and I, drop, I drop the bowl sometimes, occasionally, not very often. But what happens when you drop that bowl? It breaks. It cracks. It, it comes apart. And when that happens, well, I've got to pick up the big pieces first, throw them in the trash, then you get the broom and the dustpan, and you sweep up those tiny little pieces of, of glass or bowl or whatever it is that they just want to slice your fingers, so you've got to be extra, extra careful, and you throw those in the trash because they're broken, they're worthless. But there's an ancient form of art that takes things that are broken and does something different with them. And I apologize if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but it is kintsugi, kintsugi. And it originated in, in Japanese art years ago, and it spread to China and other places. Whereas if a teapot or a cup or a bowl is dropped and broken, it's not simply discarded, but they take the chunks, at least the big pieces, and they recreate it into something different. They take maybe liquid gold or liquid silver and they reattach these big pieces and, and this thing that was broken, which was plain, now becomes an object of art, now becomes something beautiful, now becomes new and it becomes refined. And those scars are actually a new lease of life because those broken pieces are not discarded but those broken pieces are put together so that those scars can be displayed. 
And could it be that God wants to use us, even though we may feel insignificant, even though we may recognize and see the the areas of our life that are broken, but God wants to take us and heal us and not discard us, but to display us as a new creation, display us as something new. Now, this is one of, one of maybe two times of the year where much of society is thinking about Jesus. Much of society is thinking over these next seven days, starting tomorrow, which is Palm Sunday, something called Holy Week, where many, many people in the world are thinking about the last seven days that Jesus was on this earth. And so we're going to uh, begin to examine that a little bit because I, I think that even though it's a story that's well known from a, a majestic entry uh, to a, a tragic death and finally to a holy resurrection, it, it's a picture that we need to continue to hold on to, maybe especially in our world today. Because it's easy to get caught up in other stories that we hear, whether it's the tragedy of a shooting or a tornado or whatever the the news cycle is feeding us today, it's easy to get caught up into that story and to forget the most important story, the story of a Messiah of Jesus who came and ended dying on the cross for us. Now, we know how the story ends, and we we sung about that, and it's incredible and it's beautiful, but how does the story begin? Well, maybe it depends on where you start telling the story. And today we're going to kind of start at the beginning, and, and we may take a little side angle uh, and, and maybe t- settle down on a part of the story that we don't usually think about uh, very often. But I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20 uh, begins... Uh, with Jesus telling parables and and teachings and so forth. And when you get to the end of Matthew chapter 20, we find Jesus in Jericho. And in other gospels, it tells us that this is where Jesus interacted with the wee little man Zacchaeus. And uh, at some point while Jesus was in Jericho, there were some people who were were disturbing the peace, you could say. There were some people on the side of the road Matthew tells us there were two other Gospels, tells us there was one by name, Bartimaeus, and there's some blind people on the side of the road, and they are shouting. They hear Jesus coming by, and they say, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon us. And the crowd's like, shh, be quiet. You're disturbing everybody. People don't want to hear you yelling and shouting. And so, of course, they yell louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And and the people continue to try to shush them. And finally, Jesus comes to where they are, and, and he stops, and he asks a question. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? And they say that our eyes may be opened. And in verse 33, it says, uh, they say that our eyes may be open. In verse 34, it says, Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. In other gospels, it says that he said, go, your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. But Jesus had compassion, and it says, immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. So Jesus is in Jericho. He heals a blind person. What's the very first thing they see? They see Jesus. It doesn't tell us how long they've been blind, but they once were blind, and now they see, and they see Jesus, and it says they followed him. Now, how far did they follow him? I like to imagine that they followed him all the way, because Jesus leaves Jericho, and the very next verse, chapter 21, verse 4, it says, when they drew near Jerusalem— So this is it. My subtitle says this is the triumphal entry. So this is Palm Sunday. This is the last week. And so Jesus healed this blind man, and they followed him. And the next place we see Jesus, he's in Jerusalem. Now we know from the Gospel of John that he actually stopped in Bethany, and he spent the night with his friends, Lazarus, and the sisters, Mary and Martha. Now now he's traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem, 
Some of you may be going there in a couple months with the, the church group. Now, that's a trip of about 18-ish miles, about 18 miles, depending on how curvy the road is. So that's, that's a long walk, but not, not terrible, 18 miles. We could probably all do that before the sun went down today. Yeah, you could. You could do 18 miles. Uh, but it's a little different because Jerusalem sits at about 2,500 feet of elevation, uh, that's about the same as Lookout Mountain. Lookout Mountain's about 2,400. But Jericho on the Jordan River, that's actually below sea level, about 1,000 or 1,200 feet below sea level. And so in that 18 miles, they're going about you know, 3,500 feet of elevation. So they're going literally up to Jerusalem, not just to walk, but this has now turned into a, to a hike. But I still imagine that these blind guys, that they were following Jesus because it says they followed him. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, okay, our, our, our story's picking up here. There, there, it's a little town uh, a mile or two outside of Jerusalem uh, at the Mount of Olives, and it says here, Jesus sent two disciples. And Jesus gives, in this case, he gives very specific instructions. So there's a group of people, they're walking towards Jerusalem, and Jesus sends two of these disciples, and he tells them in verse 2, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. It's a pretty specific instruction that Jesus gave. And, and I want to pause right here for just a minute because this instruction, I think, can, can give us some insight, not just into this story, but maybe into our story as well. We can find truth for our day, I think, in, in this instruction that Jesus gives. And, and I like to ponder things. Uh, sometimes the Bible doesn't answer all the questions that we have. But in this instruction, I wonder... Did Jesus know this person? How did Jesus know there was a guy in the next village that had a donkey and a colt? Now, we know God's divine. We know Jesus was divine, and he sometimes used that divine insight. But who was this guy? He's not named. Who was this person? Had he been, become a follower of Jesus? Had he been in a crowd? Had he been in a multitude at some point and heard Jesus teach? Had he seen Jesus do miracles? Who was this insignificant individual. Jesus sent his disciples, and what disciples were these? You know, oftentimes when the disciples are told, said they're doing something, at least one of them is named. Uh, we, we know the names of the disciples. Was, was this one of the two of the twelve? Was this two of the greater multitude that followed along Jesus? I'm telling you, there's questions that I like to ask, and, and often they're not answered because we have just a few texts, a few verses right here. Another question that I ponder, what if the, owner, the, what if the insignificant owner of these animals had said no? What, what if these two disciples, they go into the, oh, there they are, there's the donkey, there's the colt. They start to untie these donkeys of somebody that they don't know, some people might, I don't, I don't know what you would call that, but that's, that's a little suspect. And the person comes out and says, hey, what are you doing with my donkeys? And they're like, oh, the Lord has need of them because they were following the destruction, the, the instruction. And uh, it, it turns out that he said, okay, take them. What, what if he said, you know what? The Lord has need of them. Well, guess what? I have need of them today as well. You know, we're going to Costco, and I'm going to be getting a lot of things, but we got to put them on the donkeys to get all this stuff back. What if he had said no? What if he had not agreed to this? Now, we, we know Jesus, uh, with his divine insight, knew that wouldn't happen. But did this individual who loaned these insignificant donkeys, did he know what impact it was going to have on that day? Because you might say, oh, he, he just loaned some donkeys. But let's see what the result was of this insignificant act when placed into the ministry of God. It seems insignificant, but what were the results? Well, let, let's see exactly what happened here. 
Um, Verse 3, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Verse 4, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. This simple, insignificant act of loaning an animal to Jesus actually resulted in a 500-year-old prophecy being fulfilled. Because Zechariah, 500 years before, had written down, and the people had read it, and the people had memorized it, and the people knew that when Messiah finally came, he was going to come as a king. He was going to come riding on a donkey, and he was going to come riding into town. And so this seemingly insignificant act of loaning out your animal actually ended up fulfilling a 500-year-old prophecy. An incredible thing. This simple act changed the course of this day. Because when the people saw Jesus on this donkey, suddenly the wheels began to turn in their minds. Suddenly they began to remember these prophecies. Suddenly they began to say, hey, this person that we've been talking about, this person that has been rumored to do incredible things, now we see him coming as a fulfillment of prophecy. This is, incidentally, this story is told in all four of the Gospels. All four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you might think, oh, okay, they're telling the story of Jesus. But what you may not realize is that there hasn't been a story in the Jesus' life told in all four Gospels since the feeding of the 5,000, you know, a long time before. But since then, you know, two or three of the Gospels, one of the Gospels tells the story. But now, suddenly, On this week, on this day, suddenly everybody's paying attention. And notice what happens as prophecy is fulfilled. It says in verse 6, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set Jesus on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road, Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out. This is an exciting day. This is an exciting event because they are recognizing that prophecy is being fulfilled. There was a prophecy. They had memorized it. They were looking forward to the Messiah, and now they see it in action. Now, I want to tell you something about my family. Um about my wife. So we, we don't always agree on everything. I'm sure that's not like any other family. But, but my wife, Jolie, she, she loves parades. She loves to go to parades, especially around Christmas time. If there's any little community, whether it's Cleveland or East Ridge or wherever it may be, if there's a parade, we're going to go and watch this parade. Now, on the other hand, I myself... I don't really like going to parades, and, and, but I find myself there. And, and one of my wife's bucket lists, one of the things she wants to do, she has this dream that one day on Thanksgiving, we're going to find ourselves in New York City watching the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. That's one of the things she wants to do. And to be honest, to think of myself packed in with a million other people watching an inflatable Elmo go by, that, that, does, not, that does not interest me very much. But I, I imagine that at some point, I will be there watching this parade. But this was not like this. This was not a holiday parade. This was not a parade because the team had won the World Series. This was something different. This was the fulfillment of a prophecy. This was not just a, a celebration. They thought this was going to be a coronation. They thought Jesus was coming to be crowned king, and they were excited about it, and they were, they were looking at this event and recognizing something incredible taking place. Here's one description of this parade. I just want to read this one description. It says, Never before had the world seen such a triumphal procession. It was not like that of the earth's famous conquerors. No train of mourning captives. You know, if a Caesar or another king or general won a battle, they would bring the prisoners in so they could mock them, so they could laugh at them, the captives. There was no train of mourning captives as trophies of kingly valor. 
but around the Savior were the glorious trophies of his labors of love for sinful man. And here's how one description describes this celebration. Imagine this, picture this if you will. There were the captives whom he had rescued from Satan's power. Think of the stories of Jesus. Who might be in that crowd? There were captives whom he had rescued from Satan's power, praising God for their deliverance. The blind whom he had restored to sight were leading the way. Well, we just read about Bartimaeus and his friend. The blind were leading the way. The dumb whose tongues he had loosed shouted the loudest hosannas. They couldn't talk before, but now they can lift up hosannas to Jesus. The cripples whom he had healed bounded with joy and were the most active in breaking the palm branches and waving them before the Savior. Widows and orphans were exalting the name of Jesus for his works of mercy to them. The lepers, I think we just heard about some lepers last week in the sermon. The lepers whom he had cleansed, those were the ones who had to go shout unclean, unclean, no matter where they went. The lepers whom he had cleansed spread their now untainted garments in his path and hailed him as the king of glory. Think about that celebration. This was the one they had waited for. This was the one they had seen do miracles, and now he is fulfilling this prophecy, all because of an insignificant act of one person allowing his animals to be used that day. Prophecy was fulfilled. What else happened on this day? Well, God was glorified. Verse 9, we already read the first part. It says, The multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This crowd of people are now glorifying God. This must have rivaled the the grandest worship experiences on all the earth. We read about when the Solomon's temple was dedicated and it was filled with the glory of God. This must have rivaled that because now the Son of God was here and the people were were celebrating and, and glorifying God. We've heard in the recent news cycles It's hard to even remember so many other things have have come and gone, but just a few weeks ago there was talk of revival on college campuses in our country. And, And we can pray that revival will spread not just at college campuses, but it will spread to churches and it will spread to individuals. But this is this is more than that, because these people recognize that this Messiah had come, even though they somewhat misunderstood what the Messiah was going to do. This was even greater. It goes on in verse 10. Prophecy was fulfilled. God was glorified. Verse 10, it says, When he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. So there's this huge crowd of people. Hosanna to the son of David. And they move into the city, and now more people are gathering. All the city was moved saying, Who is this? What is going on? And now it says, verse 11, the multitudes, it wasn't just the disciples, but the multitudes said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. All of that happened simply because an insignificant person that we don't even know who they are, what their name was, was willing to allow their animal to be used by God. Now it's fascinating that this is Sunday, Palm Sunday, we refer to it now, But people were still unaware of the cross at this point. It was getting closer. It was only, this was the week. Jesus was soon to be arrested, soon to to be tried, soon to have the the Lord's Supper and the foot washing. I encourage you to come out to communion this Friday night. People were unaware of all of that. But now Jesus was made known. You know, and previously in Jesus' ministry, when people wanted to crown him king— Jesus would just kind of just slip off. You know, the crowd's there. Oh, Jesus, he's king. He's doing this. Jesus would slip off by himself, go to an entirely different part of the country or find a place of solitude or he would do a miracle and he would say, you know, don't don't tell anybody what happened, how this happened. And inevitably, as we all would, they told Jesus healed me. But now on this day, something was different. 
Never before had Jesus allowed attention like this, but now in this last week of his life, it appears that he wanted people to pay attention. He wanted people to notice who he was and what was happening as he walked towards the cross. Do you think the owner of that donkey knew what he was setting in motion that morning when he allowed these two strangers to take his donkeys? I don't think he did. It seemed like such a small thing, insignificant, and yet it had huge consequences. Could it be the same with us? What do we have in our life? What different things, experiences, talents do we have that when placed in the hands of God, something incredible can take place? Because too often, maybe we see ourselves as insignificant. We see ourselves as, as lonely and cut off from anything that can be accomplished. But God says, you know what? I can work with you. You know what? I can take those scars. I can take those mistakes. And I can turn you into something beautiful. I can turn you into a work of art. Just think of stories in the Bible where God took something small and did wonders. I think of Moses. He, had a, he was a shepherd. He had a wooden staff, a stick. Maybe he used it to knock the sheep around to get them pointed in the right direction to scare a snake away. But when he placed it in God's ministry, this stick became a snake. This stick could be held over the Red Sea and the waters could part and God's people could be delivered. It was something insignificant until God got a hold of it. A, a rock in the hands of a shepherd. You might throw it at a, a, a wolf or a hawk or whatever, but when God took that rock into David's hand and put it in a sling, it slew a giant and set David on a path to be a king. God can take something small and insignificant. A little boy with some loaves and fish in his lunchbox, it's just a lunch, but in the hands of Jesus, it feeds the entire multitude. What is it in your life that God can take? Is there talent? Is there financial benefits? Is there time that you could donate? Is there something that you could do? Some circle of influence, people that you know that nobody else knows, but God can use that, and what could he do with it? I, I want to look at three more verses here. Because I think just like that insignificant person who loaned his donkey to Jesus made a huge impact, I think that myself and each one of us here, though we may think we're insignificant, that God can do wonderful things with us. Turn over just a few pages to Matthew 24. It's the same week, this holy week of Jesus, where Jesus finds himself on the Mount of Olives and he's sharing what we know, what we refer to as the signs of the times, What's going to happen before Jesus comes? And he says one thing that is a sure sign that is going to happen, and then Jesus is going to come. Matthew 24, verse 14. It says, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. The gospel of Jesus is going to go to the whole world, and then the end will come. And we often think it's going to go to the whole world. That means it's going to go across the ocean. That means, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not going to have that much to do with it. But it doesn't just mean it's going to go across the ocean. It also means the message of Jesus is going to go across your backyard to the person who lives in the house next to you. It also means the gospel of Jesus is going to go across your office from one desk to the next to the person who may or may not have experienced the saving love of Jesus. And you know what? There are people that you know, there are people in your circle of influence that, I, that I'm never going to meet, that Pastor Jerry's never going to meet, that Mark Finley's never going to meet. There are people that you know that you have the opportunity to share just a little bit of who Jesus is, to fulfill this prophecy that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations, including the people you know, and then the end will come. Let's look at one more, Galatians chapter 1. First and second Corinthians, Galatians chapter 1. Paul is talking about his, his witnessing, and we know Paul, you know, went everywhere teaching and sharing and, and starting new churches and writing letters that we have as the New Testament. 
But in Galatians 1.24, just a short little verse is something that I think can echo in our life as well. Paul writes, they glorified God in me. Or some versions say they glorify God because of me. They weren't praising Paul, but they were learning about God because of what Paul was doing. In the same way, just as we are small and insignificant and can help fulfill Bible prophecy, so the the words that we speak and the people that we know can cause people to glorify God. Not because of who you are, but because of how God wants to use you. Acts in your life can cause other people to give glory to God. I want to look at one more. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. This is actually the same day that we were talking about, the day of the triumphal entry. John chapter 12. Jesus finishes this this entry into Jerusalem. The people are shouting Hosanna. Prophecy is being fulfilled. And there's one more thing that happens because it it talks about a certain group of people, some, some Greeks, some Gentiles, some foreigners. They come up to a couple of the disciples, first Philip and then Andrew, and they say, sirs, we wish to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And Philip and Andrew, they take that message, Jesus. There's some foreigners here. There's some outsiders. They're not, they're not from Jerusalem. They're not Jewish people. They speak a different language, but they want to see you. And Jesus took that as a sign. He took that as a prophecy. And he says, well, the time has come that I must be glorified. This is why I came, that the Son of Man should be glorified. And then we look at John 12, verse 32, and Jesus says, and I, he's talking about the cross here, he says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples unto myself. If I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Could it be that we can have a role in uplifting Jesus? Because Jesus went through that week of the triumphal entry. He, he taught the people during that week. On Thursday night, he, he, he was arrested. On Friday, he was nailed to that cross, and he died a death. One week later from Sunday, the people were still shouting, but many of them changed their line. No longer were they saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Now they were saying, crucify him. And because Jesus died, he died for my sins, and he died for your sins, and he died that even though uh, we have made mistakes, even though we are seemingly insignificant, Jesus' death is what shapes us, is what binds us together and turns our broken pieces into that, that work of art to be not discarded, but to be displayed. And we might think, God, I am so insignificant. But Jesus says, no, you're not. And that's why I died for you. And Jesus says, you have things in your life that I want to use, that I want to, uh, you think they're insignificant, but I want to make them fulfill prophecy. I want them to, to glorify God. I want Jesus to be made known because of who you are and because of what I have done for you. I want to invite the the praise team back up here. They're going to lead us in a song that says, Jesus paid it all. That's what it's all about. We, We by ourselves, we have made mistakes. We are insignificant. But with Jesus, he paid it all. And so he makes it possible for us to make a difference in the life of those around us. You want to give your, your weak spots, your, your small spots, your, your insignificant areas of your life, do you want to say, Jesus, use those so that others may glorify you? If you do, just stand with us as we sing, Jesus paid it all.